In this video, we want to explore inertial navigation concepts. We'll start by reviewing dead reckoning. Then we'll look at inertial navigation in one dimension, and then two dimension, including sort of quasi two dimensional uh, above the surface of a sphere. And then we'll explore concepts in three dimensions and the complications that result from that. We'll close with a summary and previews of coming attractions. So the learning outcomes for this module are, you should be able to explain the principles of inertial navigation, and you should explain the main sources of error in inertial navigation systems. Let's review dead reckoning. This is where we got the concept that we could build inertial navigation from. If we know the starting position and the velocity, which is constant over some interval, then the final position ought to be the initial position plus the product of velocity and time. More generally, the position at a later time is the position at an earlier time plus the integral of velocity over that interval. So if we knew or measured the acceleration, we can find the velocity by integrating the acceleration. And now that we know or believe we know the velocity, we can integrate that to get the position. So here we have this constant acceleration, which results in a linearly growing velocity, which results in a kind of parabolic. Uh, it does, the, it's actually exactly parabolic. Uh, I'm not sure this image is parabolic uh, velocity uh, position there. So you just have a double integration, and each of the integrators needs to know the, the starting uh, position and the starting velocity. Hopefully the starting velocity will be zero. The starting position will be a known position on the surface of the Earth. So here we've got a platform. Uh, we're going to do motion in two dimensions. And the body frame and the Ned frame are aligned. So the body x-axis is pointing north. The body uh, y-axis, which would be pointing out of the page, out of the screen, towards you, uh, is aligned with the uh, uh, east. And the body z-axis is aligned with the down. So on the platform, we have two accelera accelerometers and a, a gyro that measures the rate of uh, angular rotation. So we're measuring the down relative to the body forces and the forward relative to the body forces. And then we're measuring the rotation, uh, the rate of pitch, actually, uh, about the y-axis. And we have to take into account that there's a gravity vector uh, which is pointing down. So we've got the platforms, we've got the gyros. We've got gravity going down. We start at rest, and the body axes are aligned with the net axis. But as we go through motion, uh, the, uh, there may be a tilt up. And as it tilts up, that creates the angle theta between the uh, uh, surface tangent the, uh, of the Ned plane and the, uh, the, uh, the, t the surface, uh, uh, the, the plane of the uh, uh, aircraft itself, the XY plane of the aircraft, and that angle is theta. So to get theta, we're going to measure the uh, acceleration in the X direction, the acceleration in the Z direction, or the forces, whichever one you want to call it, and we measure the rotational rate w uh, around uh, Y, omega Y. We integrate omega Y to get theta, the angle of rotation there, the pitch angle, and then we can subtract the components of, uh, of gravity from the measured accelerations to get the accelerations in the Ned frame. So we have to uh, find the components in the Ned frame, uh, uh, basically using trig as we've done before, and that's just our body to, to uh, Ned calculation there. So cos of, cos of theta and uh, minus sine of theta, and then uh, to go to the Z direction, the down direction of uh, Ned, uh, sine of theta and cos of theta, uh, each times F of X and F of Z, and then in the z direction, we have to subtract off the gravity vector. So now we have the accelerations in the Ned plane, uh, in the Ned directions in the x and y, uh, x and z, and we can integrate those to get the velocities and then integrate those to get the positions in the Ned plane. What if our platform is flying uh, uh, due north, straight and level, over the surface of the Earth? Well, as it continues on, then its orientation with respect to the uh, uh, inertial frame, basically, is changing. And the accelerometer, the rate gyro, is going to measure that, acceler that rate change, that acceleration 
uh, uh, angular acceleration, even though there's really no acceleration. I mean, you're just moving relative to the surface of the Earth. It's just that the Earth is curved, and that's going to make that angle change. So we don't want the theta of our platform to change relative to the Ned flame because here uh, they're aligned. Uh, the, the Z direction for the body is down for the Z direction of the Ned frame. Uh, the X direction is aligned with the X direction of the Ned frame. Uh, it's just that the Ned frame is changing its orientation with the surface of the Earth as we move far enough. So that angle will change. The, uh, the latitude uh, will change there uh, at a rate, which is the X, the north directed velocity divided by uh, the radius there, and the radius at that point is going to be the radius of the Earth r plus h the height over the Earth. <laughs> so before we integrate to, uh, our omega y to get our theta, we need to take that term out. And then there's also going to be these Coriolis terms for the Earth rotating under the platform that we're going to have to take account of. So the angular rate of change, theta dot, is the measured rate omega y minus vx over r plus h. And then we have these terms to correct the uh, accelerations given the, uh, <coughs> the Coriolis effects. And uh, those show up as products Vx Vz over R plus H and Vx times Vx over R plus H. Uh, I, I'm not going to try and explain those. Uh, I'm going to be honest. I'm, that's never been my strong suit. But let's just uh, take it as a fact that these have to be corrected. Uh, and so those uh, the square over uh, R plus H terms, those are the Coriolis accelerations. Uh, we want to integrate the net accelerations to get the net velocities and the net velocities to get the net positions. So again, it ought not it ought to be dual. Uh, other issues are as we move around the Earth, the gravity may not point towards the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the same as the tangent line to, to the ellipsoid there, uh, the normal to the ellipsoid. Excuse me. So we need tabulated gravimetric information, and that's available. Uh, uh, along, you know, just like the WS, WGS84 model, there's also gravitation, gravitational information available. And then we're going to be doing 3D motion, so we're going to have three accelerometers uh, along each axis, one along each axis, and we're going to measure the angular uh, uh, rate of rotation about each axis. So then there's going to be a Coriolis correction is going to involve cross products uh, of uh, uh, these angles with the existing velocities. Uh, and the like. Uh, so it's a fairly complicated and there's really not a lot of value in us in looking at the formulas right now. We're not going to try and implement this. We just want to understand the concept. Uh, and the basic concept again is you integrate the acceleration to get the velocity, you integrate the velocity to get the So, but the 3D block diagram here is, uh, if you'll start at the very bottom at the initial estimates of the attitude, uh, then you have uh, an integrator, basically. The attitude computer integrates uh, uh, the measurements from the body, mount, body mounted gyroscopes with some correction terms regarding Coriolis that come in from what's called the navigation computer. That's just going to be the uh, acceleration and uh, position integration. And, and we can use the attitude then. That's going to give us the Euler angles. And the Euler angles let us go from the body frame to the Ned frame. And that's what that C sub B sub N uh, uh, matrix there going up into the resolution of specific force measurements box uh, is that's the uh, uh, the the Euler to uh, 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 rotational matrix uh, uh, matrix there. Uh, so we make the measurements of the accelerometers, and we can then correct uh, uh, for those uh, uh, given the attitude and the Coriolis effects, and that gives us the uh, uh, forces in the Ned frame. Uh, and then, uh, well, except for the gravity, so we have to take the local gravity out. And so that's what that first summation box is doing, using information from the gravity computer, which is just going to be a table lookup of gravity information based on uh, geographic uh, location. So the position information is the index into the gravity computer, and you get the local gravity vector out there. And then you can make the Coriolis corrections to the forces uh, uh, based on your position and velocity estimates. You've already made the corrections on the angles, but you have to do the corrections on the forces. And so then those give you the accelerations that can be integrated uh, uh, to give you the, uh, with the initial velocity and position, to give you your current estimate of the velocity and position in the Ned frame. So inertial navigation is conceptually easy, but it's complicated in implementation. You integrate the angular rate of rotation to get the Euler angles. You measure the forces along the body axis and transform those to the Ned frame. And then you integrate the acceleration to get the velocity and integrate the velocity to get the position. 
The complications are you have to include the transport rate regarding your motion around the Earth. You have to take into account the acceleration of the rotation of the Earth. And you have to deal with the fact that uh, gra local gravity doesn't necessarily align with the, uh, the nice concept of G pointed towards the center of the Earth and 9.8 meters per second squared and all that. So we'll look at the ex errors uh, in the exercises, uh, either at home or uh, uh, here in, in class. Uh, what we're going to do next is satellite navigation. So we'll go from inertial navigation to a GPS. Thanks.